Good afternoon. I am Judy Friedman Kadish, the director of Americans for a Safe Israel, also known as AFSI. Um, and I'm so glad to welcome you as we resume AFSI's program of exciting and informative Zoom meetings. We try to bring you the latest on Israel from the mouths of some of her most active and, and informed Zionists. Americans for a Safe Israel was founded more than 50 years ago based on the principles of Zev Jabotinsky. We have always fought for a safe and strong Israel. Aaron and I were in a discussion, our guest Aaron and I were in a discussion last week about the demonstrations in Tel Aviv. Reportedly, over 100,000 left wing and secular Israelis each weekend coming to Rabin Square. And I asked what he thought about them. We were talking about something completely different. So the, the, it seems that mostly secular Ashkenazi Jews have joined in protesting against this uh, new government and they're apparently uh, saying that they are scared of the reforms that are coming their way. Um, in addition to the massive protesters, other more organized groups, also consisting of mostly Ashkenazi, secular, uh, and very often the elite, have joined in this, in this outcry and protest. Um, but Netanyahu's 64-seat majority coalition is, without a doubt, the most right-wing government in Israel's almost 75-year history. Aaron will try to help us make sense of the situation there as tensions are heating up. His work, Aaron's work, is to advocate on behalf of the protection of the Jewish, Zionist, and democratic character of the state of Israel. His involvement in these crucial issues and contact with those who are on the front lines fighting for those ideals give him the experience and the insight to evaluate the political situation confronting Israel especially now as the country appears divided. Aaron is the executive director of the Israel Independence Fund, and I am proud to be a board member of that fund. He's lived in Israel for 40 years, a time span that has provided him with the proximity, contacts, connections, and understanding necessary to spearhead the Israel Independence Fund's mission. The mission of the fund is to work with non-governmental organizations, nonprofits, that are tackling some of Israel's most pressing issues and assist individuals who are, tack are tackling those issues um, and, and some of the most important causes in Israel today. Uh, just as an aside, uh, in November, we had a mission and on every AFSI Chizuk mission, we meet with hopefully Aaron, but if not, Aaron himself, uh, a number of the leaders of the nonprofit organizations that the Israel Independence Fund works with. And we always learn so much about what is really happening on the ground in Israel. So founded in 2007, led by Aaron, the Israel Independence Fund plays a unique role in helping Israel to realize its continuing vision as a strong, secure and uniquely Jewish state devoted to the welfare and future of the people and to the values of Zionism and, and democracy. Without further delay, I turn the meeting over to our good friend, Aaron Pulver. Thank you, Judy. First, I, 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 I must uh, start our meeting tonight by uh, telling everybody how much I appreciate AFSI and the unique role that AFSI plays in connecting Americans of all backgrounds and faiths to the heartland of Israel, in bringing groups to Israel that not only strengthen Jewish communities throughout uh, the state, but also ensure that the uh, message gets through to broad American uh, public that uh, Israel is a vibrant, dynamic state, democratic state, and that uh, the importance of Judean Samaria, in addition to its tremendous historical import, is strategic in, in, in its nature. 
uh, AFSI's work in bringing Jewish communities throughout the United States to Judea and Samaria is outstanding. In fact, I cannot think of another organization in the United States or anywhere else in the Jewish world that does what AFSI does as well as it does. So I would urge you all to be in contact with Judy and the wonderful staff at AFSI uh, in order to see whether you can participate in the upcoming AFSI trip to Israel. I can guarantee you that AFSI will take you to places that most Jewish organizations would never even dream of going to, if not out of fear, out of a, uh, out of, out of a, uh, out of a misplaced sense of political uh, correct, correctness. Thank the you very issue... much. Our next <laughs> trip, by the way, will be May 15th, May 15th to the 22nd. Everybody should write that down on their calendar. If you can make it, please do so. I'll do my best to meet you while you're here as well. The issue that we're here to discuss this evening is, uh, could really be designed De, uh, defined as the uh, disgraceful usurpation of the legislature's power in a democracy. Something that we really haven't seen happen in most places in the Western world. Israel, established 75 years ago, had a clear sense of balance of powers between the legislative branch, the judicial branch, and the government. When Aharon Barak became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in 1991, he began to change that balance, which had worked quite well between 1948 and 1991. He changed it by slowly but surely eroding the legislator's power to legislate to the extent that he defined everything as being. Uh, judgeable in a court of law. If everything is in fact judgeable in a court of law, what do you need a legislature for? If the judiciary is going to adjudicate literally every issue, why have a legislature? Moreover, it was Aharon Barak Supreme Court in 1991 that began the process of oversight of decisions of the legislature that clearly were not constitutional. In the United States, the Supreme Court adjudicates between 50 and 100 cases a year. And those cases speak directly to constitutional law in the United States and to issues that are so broad in their influence that the court defines them as having utmost importance to the broader population of the United States of America. 50 to 100 court cases are accepted for a full hearing by the Supreme Court in the United States of America. Hold on to your seats, folks, because the 15 Supreme Court judges in Israel hear between 7,900 to 10,000 cases every year. That is because they have decided that everything is judgeable by the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court of Israel will judge whether the government has the right to drill for natural gas off of our seacoast. The Supreme Court of Israel will judge whether the government has a right to come to an agreement with independent African countries about the repatriation of infiltrators from Africa to their native homelands. The Supreme Court just judges will define, will, will decide to adjudicate issues concerning Jewish civil and religious rights on the Temple Mount. And they will oversee literally every law passed by the Knesset, abrogating some and accepting some. My personal experience with Israel's Supreme Court is rather sad. Six years ago, the Israel Independence Fund appealed to the Supreme Court because as you all know, or many of you know, from when you go up to the Temple Mount, when you ascend the Temple Mount, there are two lines for those who ascend the Temple Mount. There's a line for Jews who look like they're Orthodox, men who wear kippot, women who wear head coverings, 
And then there's a line for everybody else in the world. The fact that there's a line for Jews who look orthodox is clearly profiling, something that is not allowed according to Israel, Israeli law, and certainly not allowed in any, uh, in any state that would consider itself a full democracy. In fact, when Israeli Arabs appealed to Israel's Supreme Court against profiling at Ben-Gurion Airport, despite the objections of Israel's security services, the Supreme Court agreed that Arabs should not be singled out for special searches, despite the fact that planes are usually blown up by Arabs and not by Swedish tourists. When we appeal to the Supreme Court against profiling of Jews, the police department, which is responsible for the two lines that exist going up to the Temple Mount, walked into the courtroom and said in a unique uh, defense that there aren't two lines. <laughs> they don't exist. One line, there's no such thing as profiling of Orthodox Jews going up to the Temple Mount. Second line doesn't exist. Despite the fact that the Israel Independence Fund, through its rather brilliant attorney, Iris Edry from Tel Aviv, had already submitted 79 video presentations proving that there are two lines and that only Orthodox Jews are profiled when going up to the Temple Mount, the Supreme Court, three Supreme Court justices, accepted the police line that there is no second line. They accepted the police's uh, horribly poor excuse. And uh, from that basic lie, I understood that the Supreme Court in Israel had far overstepped not only its judicial reach, but also its moral reach. That rather than having judges in Jerusalem, we have people who accept lies and, and deceitful defenses sitting in Jerusalem. Israel's Supreme Court has since 1991 been very selective, not only in what they do, but in how they do it. When the Supreme Court was petitioned by Simcha Rothman six years ago, before he was a member of Knesset and before he was the Knesset chairperson on legislative authority, and he queried them as to what percentages of cases they hear which concern Arab suits against Jewish land ownership, they refuse to reply. As a result of their refusal, Simcha Rothman and the NGO that he headed at the time, Mishilut, which is funded by the Israel Independence Fund, decided to place uh, legal aids in each and every Supreme Court hearing room and count literally during a year what percentage of cases the Supreme Court heard in which Arabs are suing Jews over the ownership of Jewish property. Lo and behold, it turned out that of the 10,000 cases they hear a year, 4,000 cases, almost 40% of their cases have to do with Arabs suing Jews over land ownership. Issues that are clearly not constitutional, issues that clearly belong to the lower courts, if they're heard at all. However, they are issues in which the Supreme Court politically seeks to adjudicate issues of sovereignty which belong to the legislature. On the other hand, while in that area they wish to dictate to the legislature issues of sovereignty, when a government in Israel decides to surrender Israel's territorial waters to a avowed enemy of the state of Israel and surrender Israel's natural resources to a avowed enemy of the state of Israel, the Supreme Court opines that the government doesn't have to pass that legislation through the legislature. And the Supreme Court will not oversee it, allowing the government of Yair Lapid to be the sole determinator 
of Israel's sovereignty, despite the fact that there is a law on the books that requires any Israeli government to have a two-thirds majority of the legislature before it divests or surrenders any Israeli territory. That decision was illegal. It was illegal in the way it addresses sovereignty, but the Supreme Court was okay with that. <laughs> By the way, interestingly enough, when Yair Lapid was queried as to why he's not willing to put the issue of surrendering Israeli natural resources to Hamas, he said, I don't have to trust the Knesset on everything. A great Democrat. Israel's Supreme Court is causing a serious uh, problem today as it seeks to is exacerbate the feelings of the people in the street. And it, as it seeks to create an atmosphere of social upheaval and political upheaval around the issue of legislative reform. For a minute, let's review what legislative reform is being called for by the government. The government, first and foremost, is calling for legislative reform in the sense that the president of the court will no longer be determined by seniority. Up until now, the president of su the Supreme Court, Esther Hayut, as the president of the Supreme Court, gets their job by being the longest serving member of the court. This, in effect, is a case where the Supreme Court justices basically appoint the head of the court themselves for a very simple reason. Supreme Court justices have the right to veto the candidacy of anybody for a Supreme Court justice. Therefore, the Supreme Court justices, according to the current regulations, are the ones who will determine who sits on the court. Therefore, they're the ones who will determine who will be the Supreme Court justice, who will be the uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court. That was, we all know, in almost every Western democracy, it's the legislature or the executive authority of government which appoints Supreme Court justices. Not so in Israel. In Israel, there is a committee, and the committee is comprised of one-third representatives from the Supreme Court, one-third representatives of the legislature, and one-third representatives of Lishkat or Chaydin, the uh, Attorneys Association of Israel. However, even though it's a one-third, one-third, one-third deal, and nobody has a clear majority, nonetheless, the veto authority is in the hands of the chief justices themselves. So when Ayelet Shaked, six years ago, sought to appoint judges to the Supreme Court, the conservative judges that Ayelet Shaked sought to appoint at that time were vetoed. The only names that the Supreme Court would allow to be accepted as justices, despite the fact that others were recommended by the committee, which includes representatives of the legislature, were people of like political mind. It's not for nothing that of the 15 judges in the Supreme Court, only one, only one justice is from a Dota Mizrach. Only one justice is Sfaradik. 13 justices are Ashkenazi, and one justice is an Arab judge. So the Arabs, while having one of the 15, are basically proportionally represented. Mizrahi Jews, who make up almost 57% of Israel's population, are certainly not well represented in this very undemocratic body, which has usurped for itself the right of oversight of the legislature. Now, in addition to appointing themselves and being an old boys club or an old girls club or, or a very private elite country club, the Supreme Court also strikes down Israeli legislation. So when Israel's, uh, when, when the legislature passes laws, they automatically are reviewed by the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court doesn't like them, boom, they're out. 
through that, the Supreme Court can abrogate the will of the people. And a good case of abrogating the will of the people is exactly what recently happened in the case of Aryeh Derry, which I'm sure most of you have heard about. Aryeh Derry is, has been appointed, was appointed by the present government to be the Minister of, uh, of Health and the Minister of Interior. And recently the Supreme Court said that according to the, on, on a basis of reasonable doubt, reasonable doubt, he should not be a minister in Israel's government. Now, what's reasonable doubt? Reasonable doubt is a judicial trick used uniquely by Israel's Supreme Court. I don't know if this exists anywhere else in the world that allows the court to adjudicate an issue according to how they feel that morning without any basis of law or, or judicial reason. So, even though the government uh, legal advisor, who could certainly not be accused of being pro Bibi Netanyahu, had already opined that Aryeh Derry can in fact be a minister and can in fact serve as an MK, the Supreme Court came out with a decision just 10 days ago, stating that according to their concept of reasonable doubt, he should not be a minister. Why? Because in the 24th Knesset, in the 23rd Knesset, I'm sorry, Aryeh Derry resigned under pressure from the court because he was accused, accused of tax evasion. He wasn't convicted of tax evasion. He was accused of tax evasion. And to make the case go away because he felt put upon, and he felt persecuted by the court, he agreed to resign from the previous Knesset. According to him and according to the government legal advisor, he never guaranteed that he'd never serve again. But according to the reasonable doubt concept of Israel's Supreme Court, lo and behold, they decided that they were going to force him to resign or force Bibi Netanyahu to fire him. Rather than enter into a constitutional crisis, Bibi Netanyahu did in fact ask, told Aryeh Derry that he was forthwith no longer the Minister of Health and Minister of Interior. The Supreme Court had hoped, frankly, that by uh, forcing Aryeh Derry's uh, leaving the government, that Shas would bolt the government and Bibi Netanyahu's government would fall. Unfortunately, their dreams did not, fortunately for us, their dreams did not come true. And Shas is far more sophisticated than they in their deluded fantasies allow a uh, ultra-Orthodox Faradi party to be. And they discern that it would be in Israel's worst interest for them to bring down the government, despite the offense of the court. Last May, the Supreme Court of Israel adjudicated an issue regarding immigration to the state of Israel in favor of a foreign government. Last May, the beginning of the Ukrainian war, uh, it was clear that there would be perhaps millions of Ukrainian refugees. And in the beginning stages of the war, many in fact were making their way to Israel, most of whom were not Jewish. Ayelet Shaked, who at the time was Minister of Interior, sought to limit that migration into Israel in order to protect Israel's Jewish majority. She sought to limit that uh, migration to approximately 2,000 immigrants above and beyond any number of Jews who wish to immigrate. Of course, we're talking about non-Jewish immigration now, because Jews immigrating to Israel is guaranteed by our law of return. 
despite the best efforts of Ayelet Shaked, she could not convince the Supreme Court that it is the government which determines immigration policy, not the court. And the court overruled Ayelet Shaked and uh, raised the number of immigrants that the government was willing to accept. Just as the Israeli Supreme Court has opined that the 120,000 infiltrators from Africa are entitled to stay in Israel, they have opined that non-Jewish migrants to Israel can stay in Israel. And, uh, one can only assume that the uh, judicial legacy of this court will be that they seek to, they have always sought to undermine the Jewish identity of the country and create a state of all its citizens rather than protect the Jewish majority. I've been concerned about the issue of judicial reform for one reason and one reason only. And that reason is that Israel's press in demoniacal fury at the thought of losing the oligarchy that the press and the Supreme Court and academia has held over Israeli life have been inciting the public in a manner that we would consider unusual even in Israel's very charged political atmosphere. The political atmosphere in Israel is usually quite charged simply because every Jew has an opinion about politics. I don't know many Jews in Israel who are not engaged by politics. And because of that, perhaps our atmosphere is a bit more politically charged than some countries. But what we've seen over the past weeks is a press, for the most part, openly calling for insurrection in the streets. When you turn on the news in Israel, the three major stations, channel 10, 11, channel uh, 11, 12, and 13, are actively promoting participation in political demonstrations against the government, not reporting on the demonstrations, but actively promoting participation in them by referring to judicial reform as a revolution as a putsch against democracy, as the destruction of democracy, as the endangerment of our way of, our democratic way of life. At Bibi Netanyahu's attempt to take over the government and take over the legislature and take over the judiciary. All these things lead to a very charged atmosphere. In addition to which, we see municipalities such as Tel Aviv, which receive taxpayer dollars, municipal funding, governmental funding from the Ministry of Interior, actively encouraging schools and high school students to shut down during the week and send the students to demonstrations against the government. An action which, by the way, causes young high school students who don't agree with that radical leftist thinking to be outed in their political positions by not participating in these demonstrations, therefore ostracized. The situation is clearly reaching an absurd proportion and it's something that we should all be concerned about. In my 45 years of living in Israel, I have never seen a right-wing government actively promote legislative reform that would go to the extent that needs to be done in order to return Israel to the checks and balances that were in place in 1948. For the first time now, Yariv Levin, Simcha Rotman, 
Bibi Netanyahu are finally coming to the table with clear and resolute ideas about how to ensure Israel's democracy and how to ensure that we all have a better, brighter, freer future in the state of Israel. Now, judicial reform doesn't only relate to the Supreme Court. It relates as well, according to the proposals laid out by the government, to issues that have to do with the unusual backlog, backlogging that exists in Israel's legal system today. For a number of reasons, primarily because courts do not adjudicate quickly on issues that have to do with contractual agreements between two sides, the average time it takes for somebody to have a commercial dispute adjudicated is almost 950 days. 950 days to adjudicate a commercial issue. Now this is something that's not talked about in the press because they don't want people to understand that judicial reform has to do with how we all live our lives. It's not only about the big constitutional issues. It's about how the whole system has been corrupted by its demoniacal obsession with the PLO and with the Palestinian Authority and with Arab rights against Arab, Arab uh, appeals against Jewish land rights. The average time it takes to adjudicate a commercial issue in the United States is less than 400 days. The average time it takes to adjudicate a commercial issue in the European Union is less than 450 days. Why in the world would it take almost three years to adjudicate a simple commercial matter in Israel? Because the courts, even the lower courts, prefer to adjudicate things that buy them brownie points in terms of getting up higher and higher and higher in the hierarchy. So they can move from the lower courts to a higher court, to a higher court, and then to the Supreme Court. An experience that I personally had that speaks to that issue is when, and I'll, uh, I won't mention names here for obvious reasons, when the Israel Independence Fund hired one of Israel's most brilliant judicial minds, a professor of law, in order to write one of our appeals about the, uh, about the injustices that Jews suffer when they go up to the Temple Mount. At the time, our appeal was based on the fact that Jews are limited to only several hours a day and to only five days, six days, five days a week, when Muslims are allowed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We hired a brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, judicial uh, personality. In the middle of working on the case, we received a letter saying, I'm dropping the case. The man had been paid 50% of the money up front. And it wasn't a small amount of money. And we contacted him and said, what do you mean you're dropping the case? We've paid you good money to appeal this case. And he said, you know what, boys? If you don't like it, sue me. Take me to court. This guy's one of the best legal minds in Israel. My colleagues and I were astounded by his attitude. Until three weeks later, we read in the paper that he was being considered for a Supreme Court justice. Now, why would he drop the issue of the Temple Mount when he was being considered for the High Court? Brownie points. He didn't want to appeal on a controversial issue like the Supreme Court, and God forbid when, that would have prevented him from being appointed to the court. Now, we can see how the system works. It's corrupt. It affects us all on a constitutional level, on a personal level, personal level, on a commercial level. The left, and by the way, a famous attorney in the United States, is now claiming that judicial reform will hurt Israel's credit standing throughout the world. 
I can't think of anything more ridiculous because through judicial reform, as we ensure that contractual law will be adjudicated in a timely fashion, our credit ratings should only go up rather than go down. But there are brilliant uh, legal minds in the United States that don't consider those simple uh, judicial issues. So who, who am I to, who am I to uh, critique them? As Judy mentioned when she made her opening remarks recently, almost 100,000 people have demonstrated against judicial reform in, uh, in Tel Aviv Central Square. That's true. I doubt very much if many of the 100,000 really understand what the judicial reform is about. They don't understand that it has to do with contractual law. That they don't understand that it has to do with cases that you or I or any citizen of Israel would bring to any court, even the lower courts, to be adjudicated. They don't understand that it has to do with the power of the legislature to legislate, which is why it's called the legislature. <laughs> they don't understand the basic issues involved. What they do understand is, and they do understand this point, that this is the issue that they want to batter the population with in order to try to depose Bibi Netanyahu. In the past, over the years, they've tried to depose Bibi Netanyahu by saying that he received gifts, which he never received. They tried to depose Bibi Netanyahu by saying that his wife stole money from the president's residence fund when it turned out that she forgot to return the funds from deposit bottles. They tried to depose him by saying that he was spending inordinate amount of money on his relatives and providing them with meals, catered meals, when it turned out that his wife was giving some leftovers to our aged father. They tried to depose Bibi Netanyahu by saying that uh, he took bribes and graft over the ordering of submarines from a uh, German shipyard when it turned out that that is absolutely not the case. Every time Bibi Netanyahu has been brought to court, the case has fallen apart. And the cases against him now are falling apart. They can't depose Bibi Netanyahu by proving him guilty of crimes that he didn't commit. Even the, even the courts in Israel don't dare do that. But what they are trying to do now is to pose the legally elected government by claiming that they, in fact, are destroying democracy, when that's clearly not the case. When it comes to the democratic bona fides of this government, we should all remember that almost two thirds of the Jewish population of this country voted for the present government. Almost two thirds of the Jewish population of the, pres of, of the state of Israel voted for the present government coalition. I could tell you from personal experience that almost everybody who voted for the government knew that the government would engage in deep judicial reform. It's one of the reasons we voted for this government because we're desirous of the deep judicial reform. Therefore, this judicial reform is about the most democratic thing you or I or anybody else can imagine. We also have to take into perspective the 100,000 people who, uh, who demonstrated against uh, judicial reform in Tel Aviv. Yes, Kikar Rabin was packed with demonstrators and flags were flying. Israeli flags were present, but so were PLO flags. In fact, there was one very sick individual who actually flew a North Korean flag. Would you believe it? <laughs> Some idiot in Tel Aviv flying a North Korean flag at a demonstration that's supposed to defend democracy of all things. Just to put into proportion where the population of Israel stands, last Yom Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem, over 100,000 Jews danced through the streets of Jerusalem with Israeli flags celebrating Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem. 
And that night, it was the news item at minute 56 of a, of a one hour news broadcast. Minute 56, the 100,000 Jews demonstrating against the government in Tel Aviv take up minute one to minute 25 of the news broadcasts. Just to show you a little bit about where the press actually lies in this country and how they report the news. Uh, I'm concerned because there are good people, really good people, people who I respect, people who serve in the army, people who do their miluim, people who are dedicated to Israel as a Jewish and Zionist state, who clearly have been misinformed by television, by the press, about judicial reform, because as we all know, tell a lie long enough and people will believe it. But I'm also concerned that if they're called into the streets to do more than demonstrate, there might be quite a lot of people who are willing to do so. There might be people who are willing to block the roads, block major arteries. There might be willing people who are willing to do worse. In fact, I heard on this evening's news, Avi Dichter, a minister in the Likud government and a former head of uh, Israel's uh, security services, being asked whether he thought that this could overflow into violence, whether there's a uh, whether there's a possibility that people turn to violence in their protest. And he sort of did a dance around the question. But when pressed, he said, look, there are naive people who believe anything. And in fact, if you sell them this lie enough, there's danger. And that's exactly what's going on. There are good people who are being duped. And it's the good people who are being duped who probably are far more dangerous than the cadre of insane leftists who to a large extent are funded by the George Soros's of the world and the European Union slush funds of the world to engage in what they're doing today. The Anti-government demonstrations should also be seen as an extension, as an extension of the progressive, so-called progressive, woke war of attrition against Israel. The funding for these demonstrations is massive, massive. In fact, there's going to be a demonstration this week of high school students at Tel Aviv. As I mentioned to you, the Tel Aviv uh, Education Authority has decided to let all high school students go at 11 o'clock on that day and has urged teachers to urge their students to go into the streets to defend democracy, to defend democracy. And they are going to have a soundstage that would probably be, that's probably more expensive than any Grateful Dead concert that was ever held in the United States. And on that, where's, note, that money, where's that money coming from? Where's that money coming from? It's anybody's guess, but some more educated people say it's coming from Europe and Soros, just the way you you say. And actually, some of it's coming from the U.S. Um, but well we might have time for some questions. We have some really good ones. And um, because uh, Leon is uh, such, a, such a, a vibrant member of our group, I'm going to start off with uh, one of his questions. Um, he's very excited about the establishment of a Nahala settlement in the Galilee um, called uh, Ramat Arbel. And uh, as you were telling us before, yes, it's going ahead. What else is happening in the Galilee? Those of you who have been on AFSI trips to the Galilee have 
probably taken note of the fact that the open areas of the Galilee are slowly but surely being built upon illegally by Israel's Arab residents. Over the years, Israel's uh, slim Jewish majority that existed in the Galilee in the 1960s and early 1970s has been eroded to the extent where today in the Western Galilee where I live, Jews are a 26% minority. And in the Mizgav Regional Council, which is not far from here, Jews are a 9% minority in the region, 9% minority in the region. The government, all governments, including Bibi Netanyahu's previous governments, have failed miserably in seeing that a Zionist challenge sits at our doorstep in terms of ensuring Jewish land rights in the Galilee and in the Negev, as in Judea and Samaria. But we should understand that the Galilee is uniquely strategically important to the future of the state of Israel. If one looks at a map, one will see that between Shechem and Beirut in the north, the only thing that prevents a geographical contiguity between those two points is a Jewish Galilee. We're losing that Jewish Galilee. And by losing that Jewish Galilee, if there's a, uh, a population continuum from Shechem all the way to Beirut, to Lebanon, then Israel's security will be deleteriously affected. We need not one new settlement, one new Jewish settlement in the Galilee. We need 50 new Jewish settlements in the Galilee in order to turn back that tide. By the way, 50 new Jewish settlements in the Galilee will have a wonderful positive effect on bringing down real estate prices throughout Israel by making land available to, Jewish, to Jews. Now, there are a couple of inequities in terms of Jewish settlement in the Galilee, which have to be immediately addressed. The first one is, guess what? A present from Israel's Supreme Court. <laughs> Israel's Supreme Court 15 years ago came out with a brilliant decision saying that Arab communities may by law discriminate against Jewish citizens by preventing Jews from buying property in Arab villages in order to preserve the unique identity of, Jew of Arab villages. Sounds nice. However, Arabs are not prevented from buying property in Jewish towns and villages in order to preserve Jewish identity of those towns and villages. No, no, no. <laughs> so while I cannot buy property in an Arab village, they could buy properties in my village. And the village where I live is in danger in 15 years of having an Arab majority, where the Arab villages all around where I live are protected by Supreme Court rulings. How is it that Israel's Supreme Court, on the one hand, prevent, protects the ethnic identity of village A and is determined to destroy the ethnic identity of village B? They did this by precluding our ability to determine who buys property in our village. According to Israel's basic law, the nationality law, Jewish communities have the right to ensure a Jewish continuum. The Supreme Court has gone against that time and time and time again. And the result of those Supreme Court decisions on the ground in the Galilee is that there's hardly a Jewish town or village in the Galilee where Arabs have not moved in in mass in order to uh, purchase properties. In fact, the Israel Independence Fund, together with a organization that we fund, Ad Khan, has done intelligence work on the issue. And we found out that Lo and behold, George Soros has funded a new Israeli NGO called Good Neighbors, Shechemim Tovim. And guess what the object of Good Neighbors is all about? The object is to convince Arabs to buy in Jewish neighborhoods in order to create binational communities. 
with binational education in order to destroy the state of Israel. In addition to which, in a mad rush towards affirmative action, previous governments, particularly the Ehud Barak and Yitzhak Rabin governments, enacted legislation allowing the Israel Lands Authority to massively discount land being sold to Arabs for private homes. So that if my children who served in the IDF want to buy a plot of land to build a home in my village, it will cost them 1.1 to 1.3 million shekel. In the Arab village of Majd el Krum, which by the way is ruled by the Islamic movement, plots for building private homes are sold at 90,000 shekel. Affirmative action. Why do my kids have to pay 15 times the amount of their kids? When their kids didn't serve this country for a day, and simply by extrapolating the evidence at hand, I would assume that their kids would push the button and make Israel go away if they could. Those are the challenges facing us in the Galilee today. All of Israel is one front line. Yeah, we'd love to hear some solutions, but um, I know Helene has, uh, we, we have a lot of questions, so. Uh, there, there are a ton of questions. Before we, before we take any other questions, I, I, must, I, I must make one comment. There's a gentleman online I see here, whose name is Fred Poker. And I don't think I've seen Fred Poker for, I don't know, would it be 48, 49 years, Fred? You Pretty can much so. <laughs> I can't tell you how excited I am to see you here. <laughs> you will have an opportunity to chit chat after we're we're all finished, if you want. I couldn't wait. Good. <laughs> He's right next to you. Yeah, in, in, on my my screen view. Um, Helene. So, several people have pointed out that Israel does not have a constitution. So making laws that are constitutional could um, present a problem in and of itself. And in, in addition, Shanna Fould asks that um, the, current, the current proposal to reform the, the uh, court gives too much power into the hands of our current Knesset and that a margin of 61 to 120 to overrule a decision is too narrow. Can you talk about that? Yes, well, let me take the latter first. In terms of the 61 margin, the 61 margin has been proposed uh, by the government. Uh, Simcha Rothman, who has the Judiciary Committee in the Knesset, I believe is talking about a slightly higher number. Uh, for the most part, the, the Supreme Court justices who, and, the other ju and other people who are fighting this tooth and nail don't really care what the number is. They're against the principle. They're against the principle of once again reestablishing the checks and balances that existed in 1948. Uh, the issue of the legislature having the right to override the court is what's at the heart of their opposition. And whether it's 61 or 62 or 63 or 64 or 65 is frankly immaterial. They'll fight tooth and nail over any number at all. If they were serious, if they were serious about uh, negotiating and uh, dialoguing with the legislature over the numbers and over the fine details, the Chief Justice Esther Hayut would have said so in her speech eight days ago to the nation. Rather than that, she drew battle lines. She drew battle lines. She didn't offer any opinions in her speech as to negotiating an agreed upon reform. Rather, she's against all reform. She's against any reform. And the justices are against any reform because like most elites, 
at the idea of losing power, they're screaming like a stuck pig. So having said that, would you remind me of the essence of the first question, please? <laughs> the, the first question had to do with the fact that Israel does not have a written constitution. So Thank how you. do you determine I remember. The Israel has a set of basic laws. The set of basic laws that exist in Israel today, the right to free speech, the right to freedom of worship and religion, the right uh, of uh, association, uh, all these basic laws are considered constitutional. They're considered constitutional. And while Israel doesn't have a constitution in the American sense, the basic laws of Israel are immutable and are considered constitutional by everybody, by the government, by the legislature, certainly by the court, and uh, they, the corpus of those basic laws is basically a form of constitution. There have been calls in Israel to codify those formally and create a constitution much like in the United States, but most legislators in Israel and most justices in Israel agree that those laws are still formative and it might not be the right time to codify them. As an example, only three years ago was a basic law added to the, uh, the corpus of basic laws that preexisted that defines Israel as a Jewish state. Believe it or not, that law was not codified till, about, till several years ago. So our basic laws are still evolving and uh, they do serve as a constitutional basis guaranteeing basic rights uh, to all citizens. Okay, we had a question for, from uh, Paul Pesach Rogaway. Um, and I'm curious about this too. Are there any members of Knesset in the opposition who you believe would vote for any of the reforms, whether it's the grandfather clause or the judicial reform or, uh, any of the reforms that have been put forward as as what the the uh, new government is is ready to do. I believe that there would be. However, in the charged atmosphere, where this issue is considered uh, causes belly by the insane left for outright war against the government coalition, I don't think so. Intellectually, I think many would agree. Intellectually, I think the majority of the opposition would actually like to uh, engage in debate, honest debate, and perhaps even negotiate the terms of the legislative reform, but that will not be allowed. It won't be allowed by their party leaders, by people like Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid, because this is their bat to bash the government. This is their vehicle for deposing the legally elected government. And uh, I don't think, I think they will uh, demand uh, party discipline and not allow anybody to move an inch away from it. I'm gonna ask one last question. And then, because we're running over time, um, the judicial reform issue seems to have been the, the first priority. Um, there are other controversial issues. Do you think that the Netanyahu government was correct in setting this as the first issue to address? Absolutely. Because in the charged atmosphere where the court finds everything to be adjudicatable, we can only imagine what the government would, what the court would do with other, other governmental decisions. So as example, uh, the government has decided to uh, fully engage its promise of 10 years ago and allow for a new Jewish settlement to be uh, 
to be built in the Galilee. There are already calls to have that decision determined by the Supreme Court. Arabs are already petitioning the Supreme Court to stop that. And the Supreme Court may adjudicate that it must be stopped. And they don't have to have standing or anything. The Supreme Court would do that over everything. So I can't imagine one area of endeavor that the Supreme Court wouldn't try to trip the government over. Ensuring the fact that the legislature legislates is the prime directive today in order to ensure that Israel be a full operating democracy, in order to ensure that the two thirds Jewish majority that voted for this government has a say in Israel's future, in order to ensure that the elites no longer rule the country, but that the people rule the country. This is what it's all about. The elites have ruled for too long. It's time for judicial reform, and we need it now. We need it yesterday. We've seen a court that lies through its teeth. We've seen a court that is predisposed only to Arab claims of Jewish land, of, of, of land ownership. We've seen a court that is predisposed to every woke issue under the sun. We've seen a court that adjudicates everything to the obscene extent that they hear almost 10,000 cases a year, 15 judges. How do 15 judges hear 10,000 cases? I'll tell you how they do it. According to the political issue, they put a check next to one without investigating beyond their nose and an X next to the other without investigating beyond their nose. That's how they hear 10,000 cases a year. So, so when we appeal to them about the Temple Mount, they don't look at the 79 videos that have been deposited as evidence. They don't have time for that. They've only got time to go into their chambers and say to each other, yeah, let's get rid of these ridiculous Jews. Boom, out they go. And on that note of your extremely wonderful argument for, for reestablishing a democracy in Israel, we thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your experience, your knowledge with us today. And uh, it's, it's just been uh, a pleasure. So It's my pleasure uh, being here. It's always a pleasure to be with uh, the FC group. Great. Thank you.